Hello everyone, my name is Charles Dudo and welcome to Mobile Multimedia Storytelling. So I am an instructional assistant at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I also received my bachelor's here. I studied in the electronic media sequence. So if any of you guys are familiar with Tim England or Rainy Camp, that's kind of my side of stuff. At least it was in my undergrad before I started working on my master's in digital media. I also work as a program producer at KTSWR, own student-run radio station. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. And in the past, I've also worked for KBVO-TV. If you're familiar with KXAN News, KBVO is kind of like their sister station. It's a, I guess you could call it their baby station. And so I usually hold my office hours in Old Main 106A. And if I'm not in there, I'll be in ASBN 350. As you can see, I hold office hours Monday 1 to 4 p.m., Tuesday noon to 3 p.m., and Thursday 1 to 3 p.m. And I just wanted to warn you that those office hours are actually for the web design class as well as FDOM since that's where I teach, or those are the classes I help out with, you could say. And so you can come get help too. Just know that those students are going to get um, preferential treatment, I guess you could say, all right? And if you need to email me, my email is right there. So today we're going to talk about some technical details. We'll talk about the types of cameras, aspect ratio, resolution, and frame rate. We'll also go with the best times of day to film since the time of the day can really affect lighting, of course. And we'll also go over framing and a little bit of composition stuff. And we might even talk about a few effects, maybe something like transitions, some fades or dissolves. So going left to right, we have mobile phones, and that's what this lecture is going to focus on. We also have what you would call point-and-shoot cameras, and those usually are a slight upgrade over our phones, although I would say today our smartphones are definitely making those kind of obsolete. In the middle we have DSLRs. Those are high-quality photography cameras, although these days they can also have video features, and a lot of people have moved over to using those, despite the fact that they don't have as high-quality audio controls. And moving on from DSLRs, we have what you would call prosumer or broadcast cameras. And those cameras are very, very high quality run and gun cameras. And what I mean there is that news teams or sports uh, shooters really like to use those and they can stand up to some abuse and they're just really good for TV stations. They're also used by documentarians a lot. That's kind of what I have. In fact, the JVC right there is what I use. And finally, we have that red camera down there. That's a digital cinema camera. And those are incredibly expensive cameras that surpass what film can do. And they're just way, way out of our reach anyway. And you wouldn't even use them in news or PR or whatever you study here at the SJMC. So mobile video is obviously going to have some strengths and weaknesses. The best strength, in my opinion, is that it's readily available. And it's internet connected, which means anything you shoot or film on your phone can be shared immediately to social media. And I think lately we've seen a lot of citizen journalism where we expose things like police brutality. And uh, we've also seen evidence of riots and stuff like that. And it spreads virally on Twitter. And of course, there's also got to be some weaknesses, right? You're going to see shaky video. The audio quality is often pretty mediocre compared to other cameras, especially broadcast cameras. Those have incredible mics on them usually. There's also what I like to call vertical video syndrome, and that's when you don't hold the phone horizontally. And of course, you have a lack of professional controls. And I think that really shows itself when you look at what a news team would shoot. Now, aspect ratio has to do with the shape of the camera frame. And so below this, we have a little a little picture of various aspect ratios. Four to three, that's the traditional old school TV, the kind of rectangle shape that we are used to. 16 by nine, that's what 1080p or 720p high definition would be. And then there's some other ones there, one by one. And the way this works is it's width by height, right? So a one by one ratio will have one pixel horizontally for every pixel it has vertically. Whereas four by three will have four horizontally and three vertically. And so we have two aspect ratios here that are pretty common. There's the four by three, that's the old rectangular TV standard, and there's also the 16 by nine standard. That's kind of the widescreen format that caught on, although there's other widescreen formats as well. And of course, this aspect ratio will affect the resolution directly, right? So a four by three aspect ratio might be 400 by 300, or a 16 by 9 aspect ratio might be 1600 pixels by 900 pixels, right?
And so there's two pretty common resolutions that we would use today. There's 720p and 1080p. And of course, that's the full resolution there. 1080p would be 1920 by 1080. And again, these are 16 by 9 resolutions. Thus, for every 16 pixels there are horizontally, there are 9 pixels vertically. Now let's talk about frame rate. So technically, film and video is still just a series of arranged still images. And if you recall flipbooks from your childhood, it's the motion to the next image that creates the illusion of movement, right? And so we measure the frequency of these frame rates in something we call FPS, or frames per second. And an early frame rate that was used uh, in traditional film, maybe back in like the 1920s or so, would have been 18 frames per second. Today's frame rates are very regional, or use particular. And what I mean by that is there's one set of frame rates, NTSC, that obviously rules here in North America, and then there's PAL, or CCAM. And I believe CCAM is actually a subform of PAL. And that's kind of the European standard. So NTSC frame rates would be US frame rates, right? And the common US frame rate is 30 frames per second, or more accurately, 29.97. Now I could spend a whole lecture on why the frame rate here isn't an exact 30.0, but it's pointless. So you can see we also have a 60 frame rate, and uh, that would technically be 59.94 FPS. There's also PAL, and that's the European frame rate, if you recall, 25 frames per second and 50 frames per second. And so people sometimes will say PAL is way better than NTSC because it's 0 0.00. There's also a film frame rate, and that's 24 frames per second. Now, there's an NTSC format that is supposed to feel filmy, and that's 23.98, and that's compatible with our broadcast equipment. Now, this is an interesting video. It's going to show you the frame rate 24 versus 30 versus 60 and you'll see kind of how frame rate will affect motion, all right? So hopefully you were able to tell the difference there. 60 should have seemed way smoother, and 30 would have been a little bit smoother than 24, but as you can see, when you start to get up into the 50 and 60 frame rate, wow, you're shooting some pretty smooth video. Now, if you didn't realize earlier when I kind of mentioned the vertical video syndrome, widescreen is clearly the optimal format for videos. And I would say that because human vision is just closer to our widescreens. In fact, almost all of our devices are horizontal, right? Our laptops, our desktop computers, our TVs, and our phones, which we usually hold vertically, can easily be uh, shifted or reoriented to be held horizontally. So the one exception to shooting horizontally would be Snapchat. Vertical video is absolutely king on Snapchat, and that's because it's a very specific platform. So outside of a specific platform like Snapchat, never shoot vertical video. I, I really do mean that. But if you are using Snapchat, or maybe there's another one that is also vertical, then that would be acceptable there. But only in those situations, I have to stress that. So this is just a funny little graphic to remind you guys to shift your phone horizontally, right? You can see here, step one, you're holding it wrong. Step two, you tilt it so it's horizontally. And then step three, I guess you record. And yeah, step four, you're still recording, right? So now I wanted to talk about the best time of day for filming. Simply put, guys, anyone can shoot amazing photography when it's the sunrise or sunset. I like to call this either the golden hour or the magic hour because it casts that really, really special light that's just so gorgeous. Now, there's this other good time of day for filming, and that's overcast. Believe it or not, if I were shooting any sort of sport footage outside, any sort of sports, maybe football or baseball or something, I would want it to be as overcast as possible without any risk of rain. The reason for this is it casts a really soft light on your subjects. And so it just looks way better than if it were a really, really bright day with no clouds at all. 
Now, I wanted to talk about a little thing called the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds is a framing method to create balance in your photos. So as we can see here, we have this beautiful little light tower, and we have this grid on the, I guess what you would think is the, the camera frame, right? And you can see that they line up the subject, which is obviously the tower over there, with this line. And the reason they do that is because it creates balance. If this were lined up in the center of your screen, it would be kind of a boring shot. Here's another example. Again, we have a nice photo taken during the magic hour, remember? That's what I like to call it. And you can see here they've used that line to put her off to the side here to create that balance. We see the beautiful sunset over there. And you can also see that where her eye would be, there's another line intersecting that. You kind of want to use that upper line to intersect the eye level. And in this example, you can see that the horizontal line will again match her eyes. She's put off to the side of the frame just a little bit. And again, you don't always have to shoot like this. Sometimes maybe a centered shot is better. But it's definitely a nice way to vary your shots. In the early days of journalism, TV reporting crews actually had two rolls of film. There was an A roll, which was high quality. It had audio, and that was for interviews. Then there was B roll, and that was for shooting additional footage. So for example, if there was a robbery at the bank, you would use B-roll to shoot footage outside the bank of police and stuff. You can easily fix errors in your work by covering with B-roll. And you can also skip through parts of interviews or make questions flow seamlessly just by covering it with what would usually kind of seem like stock footage. And so this is a little video I worked on with Dale Blaston Game for the South by uh, Texas State Project. You might have had him as an instructor before. Right now, he's teaching at them. And so let's just skip a little bit further ahead. I am incredibly excited and uh, honored to be speaking at my first South by event this year. Uh, I'm hosting a panel called Teaching Tech Outdoors, and it's a future 20 panel, which means it's 20 minutes, kind of quick in and out. Uh, panel talking about my mobile storytelling in the park class, where I take undergrad students get them out of their comfort zone of just sitting in a classroom or lecture style learning. And we take them to state parks and get them to produce content for Texas Parks and Wildlife. So I'm gonna be focusing on um, anxiety and, and learning opportunities in this experimental space with that. I presented on this at a conference in New York City uh, early fall and uh, you know, it'll be a little bit different now because I'll have another class under my belt so that was all data from my first class, which was last spring. Um, I'm currently teaching the same class again, and we're actually going to the park this weekend. So I'll have a whole new set of data to incorporate with that. Um, but really, I've written so much about this. You know, I've had a couple of published articles on this, and um, I, you know, it, it sounds stupid, but I think I've kind of carved a niche out as the parks professor. Uh, which is really cool and so it's nice to actually get up in front of crowds and be able to talk about these cool things because anytime you talk The biggest part about b-roll is that it makes your interview seem more interesting He was talking about his parks class and we actually got to see what the park looked like, right? And so another takeaway here is that you're also able to skip through the interview There were a few times I actually went in between different parts of the interview while we went through that sequence of b-roll there now I wanted to talk about a nice little documentary method called the five shot sequence or the five shot method. It's basically a method of gathering B-roll. You can get close up of the hands, close up of the face, you can get a wide shot for context, then you get an over the shoulder shot, and then your fifth shot is an unusual or alternative shot. Don't be afraid to get high and don't be afraid to get low for these shots because you just want to get a fifth different shot. And depending on your project you might also want interview footage. And of course, if you're not doing an interview, then you could use narration. There's nothing wrong with covering narration with B-roll. So let's just go through a sequence of the five shot method here. We can see this gentleman's hands in this book and it kind of seems mysterious to me. That's when we see his eyes as he's looking down at the book. Still kind of some mystery. We get a wide shot for context. Then we get the over the shoulder shot and we see it's some sort of book with animals in it. And of course, we got an unusual shot here, and the photographer was not afraid to get high for this. So again, just don't be afraid to take a random fifth shot, all right? 
Now there's something I see a lot on amateur video. It's zooming. You're faced with this dilemma to zoom or not to zoom. Expensive camcorders and DSLRs, they're going to have zoom lenses. The JVC you see down there, I used it at KBVO one fall when we were doing sports. And it has an actual powered lens, and that means there's a motor that would push the lens back and forth as I zoomed. Now our smartphones, they have, a, they have something called digital zoom. And you're actually only cropping the camera sensor, you're not zooming. And so generally with smartphones, it's better to get closer. Now if it's a case where if you don't zoom in, you won't get the shot, then zoom in. But try and do it sparingly in those types of emergency situations, okay? Now I wanted to talk about something called shallow depth of field. And it's a camera effect that is considered cinematic. You can use it to isolate subjects from the background. And it's best for you to think of this as selective focusing. And a lot goes into creating this type of look, like the aperture of the lens, and that's actually the size of the lens, right? And on our phones, it can't really shrink down the way it can on a DSLR. And there's also the size of the camera sensor. And as you can imagine, a DSLR or broadcast camera would have a much larger sensor than the one on our iPhone or Android device. And this would be an example of shallow depth of field. We can see that this gentleman's legs are in focus, but the street isn't. We don't really see anything in front of him. And then there's this girl on the right. And she's holding up a Canon lens, but her face is really blurred, right? The Canon lens is clearly the subject in this photo. And for this middle photo on the bottom, we can see the person is clearly isolated from the background as well. And so just to reinforce here, shallow depth of field, you can really isolate the subject and create that cinematic look like that. Now the fact of the matter is, because of the small sensors on our phones, it's going to be a little hard to recreate that look. Although if you put some work into it, you can. But there's also something called a deep depth of field, or deep focus. And as you can see here, on this left picture of the docks, everything is in focus. So it's the exact opposite of shallow depth of field. And you can see the same thing here on these other two photos. And so a deep depth of field, like I said, it's the exact opposite of a shallow depth of field. It's where the whole frame is in focus instead of just the subject. So when it came to video editing, I didn't want to focus on too many different effects because the truth is, It'll vary a lot depending if you're on Windows or Mac. And if you use the computers at the lab, you also have a choice, whether it's iMovie or Adobe Premiere Pro that you use to edit. And so I just wanted to show you some different transitions. These are going to be called fades and dissolves. So fades are when the camera frame will go completely black and then it'll fade back up from, from black, right? Dissolves are when two images are superimposed. So to wrap up, I wanted to talk about the YouTube audio library. Adding background music can really make a lot of videos feel more complete and I generally do this when I have an interview or a simple PSA that I'm working on. YouTube is a great resource. All you have to do is look up the YouTube audio library and it has both music and sound effects and so usually each song or effect will need you to attribute the artist in the description of the video but a lot of songs don't require that and i think it's just a great way to make your videos just a little bit better it's a good finishing touch and so that's actually it for the mobile multimedia storytelling lecture thanks for watching